Today we are going to discuss two of the more prominent, maybe the two most prominent figures in the Detroit Tigers offseason this winter, which is Eduardo Rodriguez and Matt Manning. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked on Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Thursday, October 26th, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked on Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team, every day. Be sure to check out the SiriusXM app. You can just search any team and get their home radio broadcast anytime, anywhere, straight from the app. It's an awesome feature. and an awesome app, the SiriusXM app. So uh, we are back for another episode. Hope everyone is having a fantastic week, the home stretch of the week, weekend right around the corner. Uh, today we're going to clump together two of the – polarizing is the word I used at the beginning. I guess maybe that uh, that is the word I want to go with. But certainly two of, of the more prominent – or maybe I said prominent – Whatever, whatever P word I said, um, I, I do think that these are uh, two two of the biggest question marks going into the winter is Matt Manning and Eduardo Rodriguez. And for different reasons, right? Uh, Eduardo Rodriguez is a big question mark because everyone's wondering what his future with the team even looks like. I think we'll obviously talk about the opt-out. We'll talk about his season as well, because that's very important into what he does this offseason. And then we will talk about where he's going to be, what his status is going to look like in 2024, which uh, we've kind of been shortly discussing. We've been talking about here and there throughout the course of the season, but now we finally get uh, an opportunity to just kind of lay it all out there before after the World Series, I think he's got five days after the World Series to make that decision and make that uh, that opt in or opt out public. So um, we will uh, we will certainly keep tabs on it. I mean, obviously, it's going to be one of the bigger storylines of the team. And then Matt Manning is is a little different. And we're going to start with him. But the reason why he's a, a big question mark is because I think most people are of the belief that like if a pitcher is going to get traded from the staff this offseason it's probably going to be Manning like and not that that's a guarantee and not that he's like on the block and they're actively trying to shop him and not that I I don't think I'd put it even over a 50 percent chance I think the odds of him being on the team are probably still more likely than him not being on the team but uh I mean you go through the rotation obviously if Erod is back you're not going to like sign him and then trade him immediately so like he, he's out of the question for trade possibility. Mize, obviously not. And like no one's going to trade for a guy, no matter how highly he was drafted, uh, coming off of, of Tommy John and having not pitched in almost two seasons. Um, certainly uh, not Tarek Skubal we talked about yesterday, right? It would take a, a, a heck of an offer. Um, we, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole again. And I mean, who like Reese Olson? Why would you trade? Uh, I got, I'm not really sure how much trade value he has. Like, we're talking about other people. We need to talk about Matt Manning, but just like going down the list of who's going to be in this rotation next year. I think the one, if you're going to trade a pitcher for a hitter or a pitcher for hitters and centered around that, I think Matt Manning is kind of the clear choice. Uh, and, and the conversation with Manning starts with just like how weird of a year he had and how weird his major league career has really been as a whole. This is a guy that when he was in the minors, we were told uh, could just like pump cheddar, right? Like this, this dude can ha- has really good velocity. He can, um, he, he can hit like mid nineties consistently, even tap into upper nineties. That was like one of his calling cards when he was a prospect. And then the other thing that like a lot of people forget about is that the Matt Manning curveball was like the big selling point. That was, you know, he has the velocity and oh, he's got this like really nice curveball. It's it was one of the more talked about pitches in the organization before like Mize was drafted. Right. And then the splitter came along for him. But like 
that was the profile. And he was a high school pitcher, and there was a lot of development. And he got drafted, what, in 2016 out of high school? Like He's been in the organization for a long time. And he has the extension and the athleticism, and everybody was super intrigued you know, with him. And, and he didn't have a great year in AAA before getting called up in 2021. And then he gets called up, and he's not like awful, but he, you know, he's not blowing anybody's socks off. And then the last two years... A, he's been navigating injuries. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But B, it's just been this like constant cycle of, well, the secondary pitches aren't really there. And like the projective stats are are horrible. The underlying stats are are genuinely like I I, I don't use I I don't think I use the word like terrible and awful too terribly often. Like they're not good. Like he he doesn't get swings and misses. He doesn't get people to chase out of the strike zone. People have a 91 mile an hour average exit velo. That's in the bottom 7% of baseball. His chase and whiff rate are in the bottom 2 and 5% in all of baseball. He doesn't strike people out. Less than 16% K rate. That's 6th percentile. Uh, I mean, barrel rate, ninth percentile, bottom 10% in the league. Uh, ground ball rate, 27th percentile. So he doesn't strike people out, but he also doesn't get ground outs. Um, expected ERA was five, four, eight. His actual ERA was three, five, eight. It's almost two runs more. His expected batting average, two sixty seven, bottom fifth of the league. Like, like none of his underlying numbers are good. None of them. The only thing he has going for him is a, the extension is crazy good, which is is a good attribute to have when your fastball tops out at like well it tops out that's again like he's just so odd he, he tops out at like 97 98 he'll hit it every once in a blue moon but the average fastball veloc- velocity velocity the uh the average fastball velocity over the course of the season is like 92 or 93 miles an hour so like it's good that he has that extension because that can make you know that can add a couple of miles per hour in in um uh, what's the word I'm looking for not expected but uh, not important it, it can make it seem a couple more miles an hour faster when you have a crazy good extension right that's the whole point of having a good extension you cut the distance to the plate you can make 91 seem like 95 that that's awesome but like you have the ability to throw 95 and 97. Because he does it sometimes in the middle of a game. And, like, he's the most inconsistent pitcher you've ever seen in your life. Uh, and it's not from outing to outing, which is even more frustrating. It's from inning to inning. He will throw 91-mile-an-hour fastballs with no secondary pitches in the first inning. And then he'll pump 97 three times in an at-bat and, and throw a slider that looks pretty decent to a righty. And you'll be like, okay, that's great. And then in the fourth inning, he's right back to throwing 91 with no slider and, and a changeup that's like okay at best. And you're like, all right, well, I, I don't even know what to make of this anymore. All of that being said, all of this frustration that that I'm airing and all of this uh, th- this this frustration that I have with, with him on the mound, like he has so much talent. I think he's still – oozing with potential he's still only 25 years old like he he is oozing with potential he has all the tools to be a really good pitcher in this league and all of the underlying numbers are bad that all being said he had a 358 ERA this year that's like pretty darn good that's that's really good Michael Lorenzen had a 358 ERA this year Erod had a 3-3 ERA this year. Reese Olsen had a 3-9-9 ERA this year. And Manning had a 3-5-8. So he gets outs. <laughs> we'll talk about his pitch mix a little bit more, then we'll talk about the injuries. And at the end of the show, we'll talk about him and Erod's futures both together because, uh, yeah, that, that's that's obviously the... Biggest storyline for both of these guys going into the winter. Uh, We will do that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at Ibotta. How does free Thanksgiving sound? This year, Ibotta is here to give you cash back and help make sure your Thanksgiving table is complete. Because who wants turkey without the gravy? Starting September 1st, for the fourth year in a row, Ibotta is giving 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving feast. Just add the offers in the app and redeem for 
and to redeem everything you need to make your Thanksgiving feast complete. All you have to do is shop at your favorite retailers and upload your receipt. Ibotta gives you cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce to personal care to pantry goods, so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. Other apps give you points that don't really amount to much, but with Ibotta, you get real cash back that you can cash out and your bank account, PayPal, gift cards, et cetera. So download the Ibotta app right now and use code MLB to get 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving dinner starting November 1st. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use code MLB. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play and Apple Store using code MLB. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back uh, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow's the Friday episode. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Assuming no news comes out of camp, we will be, we might do a little bit of World Series talk as well, because I think this will be a cool one. There's some opinions out there about this World Series that I'm not too fond of either. I, I, I enjoy the game of baseball, so I'm gonna enjoy the World Series. Um, Okay, so when talking about Manning, we, we talked about the underlying numbers. We talked about the, the two-run difference between his expected ERA and actual ERA. Um, but the thing is, last year, 2022, uh, he had a 3-4-3 ERA, right? And like the underlying numbers there, they weren't as poor as 2023, but they weren't like jumping off the chart at you either. They weren't unbelievably incredible. Uh, he missed more barrels in 2022 that's really like the biggest difference he still didn't strike out too many people he still didn't get a ton of swings and misses he still didn't get a ton of chases and they were all a little bit better than 2023 so like I guess trending in the wrong direction in some of those areas as well but the 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 biggest and then he doesn't walk people as well I don't know if I said that earlier that's that's a thing that this coaching staff and and this organization is going to love he doesn't walk Really anybody ever. Top uh, top 77th percentile. Top uh, quarter of the league there. So where do we even... I guess we'll just start with the the secondary stuff and then we'll get into the fastball. So again, we we heard about the curveball for a while. Go to Baseball Savant. This is your homework. And and look at the heat map for his curveball. The location in which his curveball ends up the most is literally middle-middle. Like, and I'm not exaggerating. Like, it's not like, oh, it's a little bit inside. Or like, if you were to break the strike zone into a, a three by three grid of nine squares, the the darkest red the heat map is on all of the curveballs he threw this year is in the center square. So that's not right. That's not where a curveball is supposed to be. Uh, you want that low, obviously. So hanging way too many curveballs for for starters. Uh, the changeup, he only threw three and a half percent of the time. There was one outing I remember. I don't remember who was against, but I remember coming on here and talking about he had like one specific outing where he threw a ton of changeups, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. And then he kind of just like stopped. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would love for him to throw a changeup more. His slider, thirty-one point six percent of the time, a lot of red right over the middle of the plate there as well. And like heat maps aren't end all be all, right? Like situations matter sometimes, you know, you, you want a, a pitch in a certain location. I'm not trying to just say, oh, like these are all over the heart of the plate. This is awful. Um, but the curveball one, I actually, there's no situation where you ever want to throw a curveball right down the middle. And the fact that most of them ended up there is, is wild to me. Um, but slider's a little bit different. You can, you know, maybe, maybe kind of argue that there's some situational stuff going on there. So even if you don't believe in that stuff, just going based on the numbers. And this is my biggest point. Matt Manning for whatever reason, whether it's the extension, whether it's the spin on it, whatever your theory is, is fine by me. Cause I, I don't think the smartest human being in the history of the world could figure it out. His four seam fastball consistently has gotten out his entire career. Uh, 2022, he had a 197 opponent batting at, opponent batting average against his four seam fastball and a 250 slug against his four seam fastball this year. He had a 214 batting average against with a 366 slug against his four seam fastball. That's two years in a row. And like his rookie year, like nothing really works too amazingly well, but like rookie year and it, he got called up mid season too. I'm not going to take too terribly much stock in that. I'm going to take the last two seasons a lot more. His run value. Okay. So baseball savant 
does and it, there's a lot of math behind it, whatever, whether you believe in it or not. Um, all of his other pitches are either plus one or worse. Like in most of them are negative. Uh, in the last two seasons combined for his entire pitch repertoire and run value. Okay. His slider this year, zero curveball negative two. last year, curveball negative two. change up negative two. Most are either po positive one, a couple zeros, and then a lot more negative his four seamer plus seven, which is very good. And a four seam fastball in 2022 of plus eight. It just gets people out. It's 92. It's not super spinny. But it just, and he doesn't get swings and misses on it. But it consistently, for two years running now, has just gotten people out. So, A, if we're just talking on the field, I want him to throw the fastball like a million percent of the time. And I, I know that you can't just only throw one pitch. But his four-seam fastball, he threw 47.6% of the time. Slider, 31.6% of the time. The curveball, 17%. And the changeup, like I said, 3.5%. Uh, just, like, become Joe Ryan, dude. Like, seriously, throw the four-seam fastball, like, 70% of the time. Like, I, and, and maybe, I don't know, like, if he wants to do that. I don't know his mindset about, like, where he stands on the mound and what he wants to do and, and what type of pitcher he wants to be. But, like, this is... This is multiple seasons of data now where like people just can't hit your 92 cheddar, bro. Like just keep throwing it. I, I don't, the, the, the name of the game is get people out and that pitch gets people out whether you like it or not. And no matter how frustrating the rest of his repertoire and his career to this point has like kind of been. He also is really good against righties specifically. His opponent OPS against righties this year was 592 with a 204 average. Lefties was a 709, which is like not bad. It's still below league average, but um, he's really, really good against righties. And his fastball is really good against righties. And his slider is really good against righties. But it's not consistent enough. His secondary stuff isn't consistent. And like, it's hard to put that in like analytics and numbers terms because like, the numbers for his secondary pitches aren't the worst things you've ever seen. They're really not that bad. But like outing to outing, inning to inning, they're just completely, it's a pendulum. It's just a roller coaster. So if, if, if I, I just want to see him either develop the change up more, develop the secondary stuff more, or throw the fastball literally 70% of the time and just game plan around that. And like, is this sustainable? I don't know. I I I, I don't know. <laughs> and, and like, it's it's my job to tell you whether like I think it, it is or isn't. I don't know. I don't know the answer. The underlying numbers would tell you, heck no, not even remotely close. But like, it's two years in a row of this happening as well. There's also injuries. 14 starts and 12 starts the last two seasons. I'm not, I don't really like blame like him or like, you know, some people really blame like the training staff or whatever. Like he, he broke his foot on two comebackers off the bat. Like that's not like a training thing or anything. That's just like, that's just like really bad luck. So I, I don't, um, I know he did have a, an arm thing last year, but like this year, none of the injuries were like arm related. Like he seemed fine fatigue wise. So I'm not really like losing sleep over the the injury side of things. I think that he can stay healthy. I think that this year was kind of fluky and uh, his rookie year was only half a season. And so that's really like only one full season of like arm related stuff to kind of like scare you. So we'll see, but it's 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 impossible not to bring up. He he has gotten injured a lot. We have this will be his fourth season he will have pitched in in 2024 and we have not even come close to him even having over 15, well, we haven't even come close to him having 20 starts in a season because we haven't even seen him have 15 starts in a season yet in his major league career. That's not true. His rookie year, he had 18 starts. I was like, that feels wrong. We haven't seen 20. That was the number I had in my head. <laughs> we haven't seen him at 20 yet. 18 starts, 12 starts, 15 starts. That's his last three years. He hasn't eclipsed 86 innings pitched in a season yet. And this will be his fourth season. So all of that 
is why a I think he's tradable. I think other teams can uh, are going to look at the profile and think, wow, like there might be something here. We might be able to uh, to develop him a little bit more. And he gets out, and we like the extension, and we like the movement on the secondary stuff, even when it's inconsistent. If we can get that consistently, boom! Like I think there, there's still people out there. Tigers included that think that he has a higher ceiling than what he's shown. I sure, certainly hope that's true as well. It's just, it it's my brain is all over the place with Matt Manning. He's such an anomaly. He, he's so confusing and we'll see what happens this winter. Let's talk about Erod. That's kind of a shorter conversation, weirdly enough. Um, Cause I think most of it has to do with the winter than it does like his actual 2023 season. Okay, but we will get into that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at Jace Medical. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world today, and it's important to be prepared. The Jace case is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life-saving medications based on your unique needs. Uh, the Jace case now offers customability for your Jace case with dozens of add-on medications. Choose the medication that bets, best fits you and your family's unique needs. Uh, you can also get gift cards for Jace Medical. You can buy a gift card for a family or your loved one so that they can get a Jace case of their own. Just go to jacemedical.com and enter promo code Locked On all caps, all one word, at checkout for a $20 discount with your order. That's promo code locked on at jasemedical.com. Welcome back, everybody. Third and final segment here, Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in. Uh, so we are. I think we're done talking about Matt Manning for now. Well, like I said, we'll talk about him and Erod both. I, I think I made it pretty clear. Like he, he I think he's, he's certainly... This organization needs bats. Like they still so desperately need offense, 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 offense. And you've proven that you can develop pitching. So what do you do with a starting pitcher that other teams might think they can get more out of? That's not a guarantee. I don't know these GMs. I don't know the market. There's a very real chance that these guys are looking around going, heck no, this dude can't get a swing and miss. He can't strike people out. And his expected stats were two runs worse than his actual ERA. Very po real possibility. Not not denying that that's very much on the table. Um, but there might be people out there that think they can still get more out of him. Uh, the Tigers might still think they can get more out of him and not move him, right? Like, it, it's just, it's there's so many different angles you can really attack with Manning. But of the rotation as it stands now, and of the starting pitchers that are penciled in now, I, I think it's pretty objective that if there was one to put your money on to get traded, it would be Manning. Uh, none of the other ones just, like, really make sense at this point. Erod is not going to get traded because Erod is either going to get extended or be pitching for another team in a couple of months. Eduardo Rodriguez in 2023 had a career season for the Detroit Tigers. He had 152 and two thirds innings pitched, a 3 3 ERA. He was a three war pitcher, according to fan graphs, an 8.43 K per nine, a 2.83 walk per nine, and a 0 0.88 home run. Per nine. So, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he was great in the first half, right? Pre-injury, he was phenomenal the first two and a half months of the season. Uh, I guess that's when the injury happened, day. Eh? So, uh, yeah, I mean, pre-injury, he was one of the best pitchers in the entire American League, like objectively. Uh, his, his numbers were fantastic. He was in the running for the ERA title in May. Uh, and, you know, obviously that didn't last. And being in the ERA title in May doesn't really mean anything. But he got off to a really, really good start. And when he came back from the injury, he wasn't bad, but he certainly wasn't as good as he was pre-injury and, and kind of got hit a little bit more. Um, the biggest thing with Erod, and we said this a million times throughout the season, is just it all comes down to his command with him. He doesn't have swing and miss stuff. Uh, his whiff rate was in the 33rd percentile. Like, do you realize, I, I just said Erod doesn't have swing and miss stuff. He's in the bottom third in, in the league in whiff rate. Matt Manning was like second percentile just to like <laughs> maybe I shouldn't put these guys on a show together because like I just keep relating everything back to Manning but like you understand that like Erod's viewed at as like league-wide not just in his fan base like league-wide he's viewed as like oh he's not a strikeout or 
or, or swing and miss pitcher. He's a, he's a soft contact pitcher. And he's still in the 33rd percentile in whiff rate and 46th percentile in K rate. Manning's in the 2nd and 5th percentile in those. Okay, back to Erod. Um, so yeah, he's just a, a, at his best. He's a soft contact guy. And he also is a guy that gets called strikes. Uh, when he's really pinpointing, he is uh, he's getting those calls on the, on the outside corner to lefties, low and in to righties, really that glove side, low corner he really likes. Um, but yeah, like he's not going to blow you away with his fastball, but he's a lefty with a lot of different pitches and can miss barrels in a lot of different ways. So uh, I really like Erod. Uh, he doesn't allow too many walks, 7.7% uh, walk rate for Eduardo Rodriguez. And that also really spiked in the second half of the year. In the first half, he wasn't walking anybody. Um, so yeah, I, I really like Erod the pitcher. Uh, we've talked about it a lot. I've said it a lot. There's always going to be a spot in a rotation that I build for somebody who has a profile like this. Um, his profile also ages well. Um, lefties that don't need velocity to get people out, that that tends to to, to have longevity to it, right? Um, and, and Erod has certainly had his injury stuff in the past as well, uh, but he also has some seasons with a whole lot of innings. And right now, he is the only pitcher. Let's just look at the innings pitch totals by the Tigers in 2023. 152 and two-thirds Erod. Next up, Michael Lorenzen with 105 and two-thirds. Michael Lorenzen was gone in July and was second on your team in innings pitch. Joey Wentz, 105 and two-thirds. Reese Olsen, 103 and two-thirds. Everybody else, 85 or lower. And that 85 is Tyler Holton, who's literally like a, a, a middle reliever. So you desperately need innings, which is one of the big arguments for keeping Erod around for next season. This guy, you know, can get you innings, even with having missed six weeks at one point this season, still gave you over 150 innings pitched this season. And again, just that that profile of, of like, you can go deep into games a lot more consistently when you have the ability to get non-strikeout outs. And like, obviously, swings and misses are, are king. Like, that's that's the uh, uh, kind of a golden standard in the game these days. Um, but you can you can really prolong your career and go further and further into games when, you know, like there's like the there's a few examples, several of them on the raise, to be honest, where like even like Blake Snell, somebody like that. And he, and he obviously this was a career year for Snell. So like maybe this year isn't the best example to use it. But previous years of Blake Snell were like he would go five innings and strike out like double digit batters. And it's like, OK, well, how valuable is that really? So. Again, like th this, this has a, a profile that's going to, I think, age pretty well. I don't think Erod's going to get significantly worse anytime soon, uh, which again is is a reason why a lot of people want to hang on to him. I think, I guess we can. I, I, there's really no nothing else profile wise. We went over it a lot during the regular season. Barrel misser, not a not a bat misser. Four seam cutter, change up sinker, slider. Outside of the slider, those are all just different variations of pitches that just move a little bit out of the same tunnel. It's how he keeps people on his toes. He's really good at it. He's a professional pitcher. He pounds the strike zone. I, I really, I really enjoy and appreciate Erod the pitcher. Okay. Now, let's talk about this winter. I've been wrong a lot in my life. I will certainly be wrong again. Okay. Can't fear being wrong uh, in uh, in in this forum. Um, I do not think Erod is going to be on the Detroit Tigers in 2024. I think that he, I, we've been saying on this show since February, uh, that he's going to opt out. And that was like, some people didn't like that, but like it, it's coming. And, and like, we've been on that wave since, since January, February. Okay. He was always going to opt out it, it, unless he got hurt this year. It, it was literally never going to make sense for him to not opt out. We got him on a on a very team friendly deal, so he's opting out right out within you know however many hours five days is from the World Series, and you are going to be left with the choice of give him a new contract or let him walk. It essentially, is going to turn into just a free agent conversation. 
Not a not a re-signing, not a anything, because he's going to opt out. The price point for me, I go back and forth a lot. I don't think he's going to be here, and I am not going to lose sleep about the fact that he's. I don't think he's going to be here either. Um, I think he's going to want north of 20 mil a year. I don't think I want to give him north of 20 mil a year. If it's around 20 mil, I'll have the conversation. If it's around what a qualifying offer is, which is not too much different than the first contract we gave him, uh, the QO this year, I think is going to be like 18 and a half mil. I want to say I can double check that when the time comes. I would do that. I would do around what a QO is going to be. 20 mil is around like my limit. And then if he's like, hey, I want add another year. So go from three years to four years and give me, you know, an, an AAV, an average salary of, uh, of like 22 mil. I think I'm turning my cheek, man. And like, again, like th- there's always a spot in my rotation for somebody that pitches like that. I really like him stylistically. But when you look at what this team needs and. If they re-sign Erod, I'm I'm gonna be pleased. Okay. My biggest thing that I, I try to remember and sometimes I forget is that the Detroit Tigers payroll next year is going to be astronomically low unless they go out and spend money in free agency this winter, which I'm not really sure they're going to. And when I say astronomically low, I mean like if you go through and you go look at the books and you remove Miggy and you review and you remove Erod. You remove some of the other guys that are that are going to come off the books. The Tigers could legitimately have one of the lower payrolls in the entire game of baseball next year. So if the difference between two million dollars is standing in the way of keeping Erod and you really like him as a front office, then like put your big boy pants on and grow up and and, and go get him. Um but if I guess it always comes back to ownership, right? If ownership gives you a budget every winter, are you going to prioritize Erod or are you going to try to get some bats in here? It's a tough question. It's a tough, tough question. As you can see, I'm very scatterbrained with both of these guys. I go back and forth on trading Manning probably every hour. And when it comes to Erod, I'm certain he's opting out. But the decision to keep him, I don't think the Tigers are going to prioritize him. That's, I guess, my biggest takeaway from this. I don't think the Tigers are going to prioritize 20 or more million dollars a year for a starting pitcher who's not an ace on a deep contending playoff team. Always a spot in my rotation for him, has October experience, is going to age well. I believe all of those things. I don't think the Tigers are going to put set aside that much money a year for a guy that when the Tigers, in theory, would be like really good again, is going to be like a two or three in their rotation. think that's where I stand. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We'll be back tomorrow talking about a couple more players on the roster. We still got Green, Torkelson, a couple utility guys left as well. And then depending on how long the World Series goes, maybe we even dabble into some minor leaguers as well. Uh, Maybe some AFL, Arizona Fall League updates next year. We'll see what happens next year. Next week, uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all tomorrow, baby. Go Tigers.